Good evening and welcome to Nova School of Business and Economics. My name is Pedro Santa Clara and I'm here to present the first Nova Atrium lecture in Macro and Finance. It is my pleasure to introduce our first lecturer, John Cochrane, uh, the AQR Capital Management Professor of Finance at the University of Chicago, uh, the Booth School of Business, uh, to give it the complete name. Uh, we could not hope to have a better speaker uh, to give our first lecture. John is the foremost researcher uh, on the frontier between finance and macroeconomics, which is the subject of uh, this lecture series. His work on the dynamics of interest rates, uh, on the relation between business cycles and asset prices, his recent contributions on monetary and fiscal policy, have profoundly changed the way we think about these matters. John has also had a huge influence in educating an entire generation of financial economists who have learned asset pricing from his textbook. John has a bachelor's degree in physics from MIT and a PhD in economics from the University of California, Berkeley, he is currently the president of the American Finance Association and a fellow of the NVER, the Econometric Society, and the Cato Institute. He has been editor to some of the most prestigious journals in economics, including the Journal of Political Economy. Besides, as a true Renaissance man, John is a member of the United States gliding team and recently participated in the World Cup, uh, and he's also an accomplished uh, uh, windsurfer. And probably his biggest accomplishment of all uh, is married to a lovely wife and has four brilliant children. Um, before I leave, uh, I just wanted to leave you with a personal note. Uh, these are not happy times, uh, especially in this country, and some of the themes that John will discuss will be very troubling. Uh, so let me tell you what keeps me hopeful about the future. Uh, it is the group of students that we have in this school. I, I came back to this country uh, four years ago after living abroad for 15 years, uh, and having taught in some of the best universities in the world, I find that we have students that are better than any that I've seen anywhere else. They are smart, they're well prepared, and especially, uh, which I think is a, a big change in this country, they have a wonderful work ethic. Uh, I just hope that we can persuade enough of them to stay in the country and help us change it for the better. So without further ado, I, ladies and gentlemen, I give you John Cochrane. Thank you, John. Don't want to give away the secrets too soon. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Pedro, for that lovely introduction. Pedro failed to mention my best two papers, which were, of course, the two that we wrote together in a lovely year we spent uh, together at UCLA. Um, it's really an honor to, to be invited to come give this talk. Uh, I, I, I hope I've, I sit there worrying that I'll let you down or that subsequent talks will be so much better that you'll look back on this badly, but I'll do my best. Um, what I'd like to do is combine a talk about academic research with a talk about policy. Um, really, my, my whole professional life, I have been doing research on, on the fundamentals of, of inflation and where they come from. And this time seems like a very good time to, to sort of summarize that research and, and think about where it goes for the uh, deep policy questions that we all face. In addition, I, I don't want to be too, um, uh, I don't want to be too subtle about the agenda here. Uh, this is a, a wonderful educational and research institution. And all too often, it seems as if research and policy occupy two different spheres. And so the not so subtle message of what I have to say is that academic research of the type uh, done in places like this is in fact quite important and provides a, uh, a mental framework that can really help you in thinking through the deep policy questions we face these days. 
And, and it is, the po kinds of policy questions we face are, are particularly crying for some for insight from academic research. Uh, the things I'll talk about, uh, deflation, inflation, and the euro, uh, especially in the US now, there's a lot of worry about uh, deflations coming. Um, zero interest rates, will quantitative easing work? Will we avoid uh, Japanese-style lost decade? What happens to monetary policy when interest rates hit zero? The, these are big questions facing, facing at least us. Uh, conversely, I, I think um, we may soon be faced with the question of inflation and how do we control inflation in the face of very large, uh, persistent government uh, financial problems. And uh, of course, there's the question of the euro, which uh, uh, went through one round of, of creative thought about how to structure it. I think after Greece and, and the pending uh, f uh, financial difficulties in lots of other countries, as, as well as Portugal, um, a, a period will come of rethinking how the euro works and how it, it should work. Uh, are there better ways to avoid crises or to structure the whole thing? So, so these are moments when you're outside standard experience, standard historical correlations. You, you have to think. And in fact, there is no, as I survey um, uh, economic and financial theory, there really is no consensus theory of equation, uh, of inflation. Uh, I can name about five different theories. Each of one thinks it's the only theory on the planet. Uh, each of one completely disagrees with the others. And you see forecasts in, if, uh, from hyperinflation to, to spiraling deflation made by all sorts of smart people. Now, they don't have different data. They have different theories in mind. So you have to think, and you have to understand cause and effect. And of course, if, if we're going to fundamentally rethink our monetary arrangements in the US, we've already rethought dramatically what the Federal Reserve does. Uh, it's, it's moved on to all sorts of policies no one dreamed of three years ago. And in Europe, we, we you, all of us, will be rethinking how the euro works. Those kinds of thoughts need, um, let's call it theory, let's call it deeper, let's call it summarizing a deeper historical experience than that which usually illuminates policy. So I will talk, be talking about inflation, deflation, money. I, I only have an hour. If I had a week, we could go on and talk about the other interesting things that are going on now. The mess of the financial banking system, the mess of financial regulation, too big to fail, and so forth. Uh, unfortunately, I won't be talking about those, but those also loom over us and, and need some careful thought. So let me start uh, 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 a little bit of theory, uh, an int a, a framework, the sort of the research review part of, uh, of this talk, which will then uh, apply. So I want to think about, um, at the deepest level, where does inflation or deflation uh, come from? And let me remind you, since this is a talk on macroeconomics and finance, and since I think the two are united, and in fact, a lot of my theory, my, my theoretical thinking is, is imperialistic. It's taking the theory of finance and applying it to macro. Let me remind you of the theory of finance. So where does the value of a of company come from? If you're valuing a company, the, so you get, you get only one equation really today. It's the one in the middle here. You have to have an equation. Uh, equations are good for you. They, they help organize your thinking. You can have beautiful prose that's full of logical fallacies, but equations are, keep you from doing that. Anyway, back to the first equation here. Number of shares times price per share is expected discounted future dividends. I hope all the students in the audience are going, yeah, yeah, I know that one. That's how we think about valuing a company. And for example, if a com we wake up and a company, the, the, we learn that a company will not be having good dividends, the value goes down. If we, uh, the, the discounted is very important. So if the, if the required return for a company goes up, then prices go down. Now wait a minute to get the sign right there. You think of returns going up being good, but now returns going up means today's price has to decline. And that's, I'm saying that again, because that's going to be an important effect in how we think about applying this to, to governments. Well, uh, if we want to think about the price level, actually, the right question to ask is, what determines the value of nominal government debt? And I include money, because money is just very short-term, non-interest paying government debt. Uh, technical language, money and government debt are really the same thing. 
Well, let's think, let's apply the theory of finance. Um, the left-hand side of my second equation, money and government debt, that's the number of shares that the government has issued. What is the government, how is the government going to pay you back if it has borrowed money? Well, it has to run surpluses, uh, taxes greater than expenditures, and use that result to pay back the bondholders, including money holders, and that it will do over time. That's the expected discounted surpluses. The price level is, now it goes on the bottom rather than the top just because of the units. It's not price per share, it's shares per price, if you will. But the price level is what mediates the difference. The right-hand side is the real value of the government's promises to its bondholders. The top of the left-hand side is the nominal value of the, of the government debt, and the price level is just the divisor between those. So we can think of the determination of the price level exactly the same way we think of the determination of any stock's price. Fundamentally, it's, um, it's, it's the value of government debt. And if, if investors decide that the government debt isn't going to get paid off, they try to dump it, and that gives you inflation. Now, you may say, wow, this is, this is weird. I've never seen anything like this. But actually, it, it makes a lot of intuitive sense when you stop and do it, when you stop and think about it. Really, this is just aggregate demand. So, so suppose investors wake up and decide that US government debt isn't worth much, and our government will never really pay it off. What do they do? They try to get rid of that debt. Well, the only way to get rid of government debt is to try to buy stuff. And if you try to buy stuff, that sends the prices up. This, if you were trained at MIT, you would call that aggregate demand. Um, everybody going out trying to buy stuff, that feels just like aggregate demand. So this is nothing more than aggregate demand, the wealth effect of government bonds, all sorts of things you have seen many times before. But viewing this way, I think, is very helpful in going back to standard intuition. Um, we often talk about, gov about government debt as if it is stock in the government. So when we think of, for example, exchange rate changes, we'll often say, well, people gained confidence in the government, and therefore the exchange rate went up. Now think about where did that come from? If you were trained in terms of monetary economics, confidence in the government doesn't show up anywhere. Confidence in the government means a lot if it means the right-hand side there is improved. This is a government that's going to be able to raise taxes, pay off its debt. So we think about the value of government debt in, in, in these terms all the time. We just don't necessarily realize it. At a deep level, what this middle equation there rep represents is the idea that, that um, money is valued let me back up. It's been a puzzle for hundreds of years why money carries any value. I, I happen to have some with me. I stopped at the airport on my way and got, you know, here's, so here's 10 euros. Why is anybody willing to give me a, a nice drink for a piece of paper? That's a really deep puzzle in economics. Well, th this, this equation is an answer to that puzzle. And at the deepest level, it says the reason that is valuable is because the government will take it in, in return for tax payments. So uh, the, the, the bartender is willing to take it from me because in the end, the bartender knows he can pay his taxes with it. And uh, this, is a, this is not a new idea. Adam Smith said, quote, a prince who should enact that a certain proportion of his taxes be paid in a paper money might therefore give a certain value to that paper money. Now you might say, oh, this is all in Adam Smith. What are you bothering? Well, as Feynman, the famous physicist, said, until you know where to put the E's in the two pies, you don't know nothing. And that's why, in fact, there's work to be done since Adam Smith. But the, the basic idea is, is there. Now again, this may, this may look like a, a brand new crazy theory, but uh, it's not. This is present in every well-articulated view uh, of inflation. The, the only issue is how much force does it carry? So let me give you an example of, of that question, an example of how we really think about things in a case where there is no force. So the standard monetarist view, I come from Chicago, so we, we pay great homage to money times velocity equals price times income. Apparently, Milton Friedman's license plates were literally MVPY. So there is MVPY. Uh, and, and I highlight, so money plus deposits, well, you know, the, so the old monetarist view is, is inflation. No, 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 forget about that middle thing. Inflation comes from too much money chasing too few goods. But it's always true, as Milton Friedman himself wrote in the 1940s, 
uh, and everyone has been doing since, then monetary policy requires fiscal cooperation. You need fiscal and monetary coordination. And the way it really works, there's always a footnote that says this. So, so the, federal, the, the, the central banks say prints up too much money, and that on the second equation results in inflation. And then there's a footnote that says, oh, by the way, the middle equation is there. And to, hold, to make it hold, we assume that the treasury will always, the price level gets determined by money, and then the denominator on the left, and the treasury will always adapt taxes to that, to that circumstance. It's always there, but it's kind of passive. Uh, well, um, maybe yes, and maybe not. Suppose, for example, that our, our government decided to engineer a deflation. So it cut money in half on the left. And therefore, the price level, by standard monitor's thinking, goes down by half. Well, now, middle equation, government debt has doubled in value. So according to this theory, the Fed just simply calls up the Treasury and says, in the US case, hey, Tim, you need to double taxes for us because we need to pay off now a government debt that's twice as valuable in real terms as it used to be. You can imagine the reaction to that phone call. In many countries, if you call up the Treasury and say, we need to double taxes because we need to support a deflation, they simply laugh at you. They say, taxes are as high as we can possibly set them. We don't have any more money. So there are certainly cases in, in which this cooperation isn't as easy as it seems. And in fact, more and more, if we think about currency crashes, currency collapses, imagine yourself, you're the governor of the Central Bank of Argentina, and the, the right-hand side, that right-hand side has just collapsed. Everybody understands that you can't pay off your debts. You can fiddle with exchange rates all you want and do open market operations all you want. That currency is going to collapse. In fact, I think all of us now, it might be plausible to think about, uh, think about many times as times in which monetary policy works, and we can just always count on the, the uh, we can always count on the Treasury to come up with any, any extra taxes we need to validate monetary policy, but that's not the situation anymore in much of the world. More generally, we have to rethink macroeconomics in the face of binding fiscal constraints, and that means the middle equation carries a lot more force than it would in other times. <laughs>